This morning I'm sharing with us a powerful message still on the overall theme of excellence but focusing on a particular life the person called Epaphras. We find him written about in the book of Colossians and his life was marked with excellence in terms of sacrificial service, in terms of prayers, in terms of devotion, in terms of fellowship with one another. God wants us to be perfect and to excel in everything we do. And as we go into this study, I want you to remind us that we are serving a living God. And that God is interested in everything that concerns us. He wants to bless us. He wants to help us. He wants to perfect all that concerns us. And today, He will perfect all that concerns you in Jesus' name. This week, I was listening to a message a man of God was preaching. And he narrated an experience he had once. There was a time he was concerned about his prayer life. And he went to the father. The father was a pastor. He founded, I think, eight churches. The father died at the age of 99, just a few years ago. So he went to the father and asked the father, what's the matter? I don't seem to be getting answers to my prayers. How can I be effective in prayers? The father answered and, and, and uh, gave him some answers. And then he asked the father the second question. He says, how do I know that my prayers is effective? The father says, well, when you get the answer, when you get what you've been praying for, when the result comes, and it's what you ask for, then you know that your prayers are effective and your prayers are answered. I mean, God has given us a powerful weapon, the weapon of prayer, through which we can control circumstances, we can control events, we can control situations and circumstances. As I mentioned recently, I went for a prayer conference uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of this month, and the man shared a testimony of what happened one day, the way in Israel, organizing a program, and all of a sudden, a severe storm arose. The wind was so severe, the storm was so severe that it was ripping up almost everything on the pathway. And they thought the program was going to be a disaster. But he just came out and prayed in the hearing of the people. He commanded storm cease in Jesus' name. He remembered how Jesus Christ did on the Sea of Galilee. He just said, peace be still. So he stood and declared storm cease. And immediately, in the eyes of everybody, the whole thing just ceased. Everybody was surprised that such miraculous, and in fact, the way the whole thing happened was seized on camera. So it became, uh, people became, uh, uh, one, uh, um, well, some were afraid, some were excited, and all what not. It was a kind of whole scenario of feelings and emotions. How can a human being just command storm and storm cease? Prayer works. I've read about a person called John Knox. John Knox has died and gone to be with the Lord many, many years ago. But in this country, I think he was living perhaps in Scotland. And uh, John Knox was a man that prayed. He prayed. And understand, and it was many, many years ago in this country, when they used to have all these wars and so on and so forth, big battles, big events. They prayed and God was stepping. They call for prayers and God will step in. And one day from the book I read, it was mentioned that the king at that time says that he's not afraid of the armies of all these enemies here. He's not afraid of all this that is happening here and there. That the thing he fears more is the prayer of your nurse. 
Because when your nurse kneels down in Scotland to pray, he will feel the impact of it right where he is in the palace, wherever it is, that he feared that uh, prayer uh, far more than any other thing else. What am I saying? I'm saying it to say that God has given us a powerful weapon that we can use to control even armies, to defeat wars, to control kings and other human beings, to change things for the better. A few years ago, and this is a story I heard personally, uh, a pastor in London was sharing this. I was in the service, and I know the person that he was talking about, I, I know that's that sister he was referring to, and he said that one day, this sister came to him, the pastor, and says, Pastor, uh, I want you to help me in prayer concerning my husband. The, the sister suspected that the husband was doing some crafty things outside. The husband will just come back maybe one week and then say, I'm traveling again on business trip overseas. He will go for two months, three months, and then come back maybe one week or two weeks again. I'm traveling for another business trip. So this was a big burden to this sister. This sister was concerned about it. And this sister was concerned that something is going wrong. This man is doing something wrong wherever he's going. How can he be going, spending almost all his time abroad in different places and so on, calling it business trip? So he came to the pastor and said, Pastor, this thing is too much. I need help. Can you pray for me? And pastor said, okay. Uh, you don't want him to be going on the business trip anymore? He says, no, we don't want. It's too much. He can do his business here in UK. So the pastor said, oh, let's pray together. Let's agree together. They agreed together and they bound him that all these useless trips will stop. The man came back and told the wife again, okay, in the next two weeks I'm traveling again abroad for another business trip. The wife just said, okay. The wife didn't say anything. The wife didn't tell him that we have prayed that we bound you. You can no longer travel. <laughs> the wife just kept quiet. <clears throat> and two weeks came, the man couldn't go for the trip. Three weeks he couldn't go. One month he couldn't go. Many months passed, no more business trip. And he didn't know what was happening. Eventually the man went to the same church. The wife ministered to her, invited him to the church, and they went to the church <laughs> and met the pastor. And I believe he gave his life to Christ. I don't know the rest of the story. But what am I saying here? Instead of this woman fighting with the husband, quarreling and saying this and that and that, she knew where the power lies. Power lies with pray, with, in, in prayer through God. That if you can get to God and agree with God, God can grant you the desires of your heart. And without you fighting, without you doing any of these things, God can bring the change that you want. So that man was tied down. I don't even know whether he, was, he ever went for any of those business trips again. But for several months, at the time I heard the testimony, I think six months had passed and he wasn't able to go again. In the past, it was every two weeks he comes back, he's off again. Every one week, two weeks, he's off again. And so on. <clears throat> but he became tied down by the power of the Holy Spirit. God answers prayers. God is alive. And I've just shared with you earlier this morning about um, <clears throat> the prayer. Um, I pray for somebody. Somebody phoned 3.31 a.m. last Thursday and asked for prayer for a relation that is in the United States of America. I pray with this person who was based in Africa, 6,000 miles from UK. A short prayer of just about two and a half minutes. And then the other sister sent a message and also prayed a short prayer, sent a message back, I have prayed. And the person we were praying for in America, thousands of miles away, had a dream. Somebody came to her in the dream and told her the answer has come. She woke up and found that the answer to the problem had actually come. And it came in a better way than she used to experience in the past. This tells us that God is alive. 
God answers prayers. So when you read about how God answered the prayer of Elijah, prayer of Moses, he's still the same God today. He's answering prayer. He will answer your prayer. He will answer your prayer. The people that do know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploit. Today, we want to look at this man called Epaphras. Now, in the Bible, you find the name Epaphras being used. And you also find the, the word Epaphroditus being used. And when you look at the way these two names are used, it appears as if they were referring to one and the same person. I don't know whether it is the same person, but some Bible students, some interpreters of the Bible feel that it was the same person. And that Epaphroditus was the long name. Epaphras was the short name, just like people who may have the name uh, like Samuel, and they, they just call them Sam as a short form. So this may be the same thing that happened here. If it was not so, when we get to heaven and meet Epaphras, we'll find out uh, <laughs> what the true uh, this thing was. But the assumption I'm going to make in this study, in today's message, is that the two them mean the same as some people believe it is. Now, <clears throat> Let me make, uh, uh, mention, say, that most names have important revealing meanings. Sometimes I go about, people ask me, what does your name mean? The name this, what does it mean in your local this thing and so on? What message does it give? Why? Because most people do know that names have important revealing meanings. Now, the name Epaphras means lovely. It is possibly a contracted form of Epaphroditus derived from the Greek words Epi, Epi translated on and uh, Aphrodite, which was the Greek goddess of love. So the name implies somebody that is on love, somebody that is lovely, somebody that love and so on. So Epaphroditus means lovely and uh, charming. And Epaphras was a person that live up to the meaning of that name. As I say, in the Bible, names used to be in a lot. And you find that there are times that God changed people's name. Uh, I mean, God changed people's name. Jesus changed a person's name. Uh, we find uh, Abra Abraham wasn't called Abraham originally. He was called Abraham. But God changed his name to Abraham to signify to, to signify signify that even though he was barren at that time he will become a father of many nations and, Sar and, and, and Sarah's name was changed to Sarah that she would become a mother of princes nations and so on and it came to pass as the names implied in the New Testament we find Jesus Christ changing the name of Simon to Peter Simon meant read like uh, these uh, slender grass-like uh, things that grow, plants that grow, that the wind can blow here and there and so on. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus saw that and said, no, I don't want you to be like uh, that. I want you to be like a rock. That when the wind blows, it doesn't move you. When things happen, it doesn't shake you. So his name was changed from Simon to Peter. Peter like the rock. A rock that never moved, never uh, against the storm. So, Epaphroditus means lovely and charming, and he actually lived up to that name. Now, um, in the book of Colossians, he was spoken of by Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, and in chapter 4, verse 12. In those two verses, Paul used these words, our dear fellow servant, to refer to him, and he also used the word a faithful minister of Christ. Those words carry very great honor and responsibility. We don't know much about this Epaphras, but from what we can read in the, in the uh, studies in the Bible and so on, he was probably a citizen of Colossae. Colossae was an ancient city in Asia Minor where it is known as Turkey today. However, we notice in the Bible that the zeal of this uh, Epaphras, 
His zeal in the gospel ministry was not limited to the Colossians only, but also to others. Because in Colossians chapter 4 verse 13, the Bible says, For I bear him record that he had a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. This is a solemn remember that a faithful minister, although patriotic, must neither be parochial, tribalistic, nor self-centered in ministerial vision. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 7 we are told, As ye also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now it appears from that that this Epaphras was their minister or their pastor. He probably was the one that founded the church in Colossians. He was a distinguished disciple whom Paul had great love for, probably because of his commitment and labor to see the Colossian believers stand perfect and complete in all the will of God as we are told in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Philemon chapter 1 verse 23 says, Then salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. That passage suggests to us that Epaphras was with Paul at this time. Most likely he was a prisoner because he says, uh, uh, he refers to him as a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. In those days it was very easy for people to be imprisoned because of preaching the gospel. Why? Because people didn't want the gospel to be preached. They banned them from preaching. They stopped them from sharing the scripture. Uh, but these people will not listen. And the punishment they ended up incurring usually was prison. Sometimes they were killed for their faith. So it's possible that he was with Paul in prison in Rome uh, when he wrote to the Colossians. Because the footnote at the end of, of uh, Philippians shows that the epistle was written by Epaphroditus from Rome. Now, in this message, I will be focusing on identifying the important features that make this man to earn that excellent title, a faithful minister of Christ. And thereby want to draw some lessons that we can learn and apply to our life and make our life more fruitful, more successful to the glory of God. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12 captures the keynote of his life and ministry. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So the thrust of his prayer ministry was not for personal life, not for personal problems, not for a project and things he wanted to get for himself personally, but rather you will notice here he was interceding, praying for other people. Intercession means praying for other people, praying for God to help them, praying for God to deliver them, praying for God to bless them. It was intercession for other people, which is a selfless dedication to seek the welfare of other people, to seek the well-being of other people. And this is very, very important because through your intercessory prayer, your brother, your sister, your relation, your children, your husband, your wife, or other people can be influenced for Christ. People that are not born again can be influenced and they become born again. God can do something for them. God can perform miracles for them and God can change things to make it better for the people as well. Of course, what you make happen for other people, God will make happen for you. When you are praying for other people to be blessed, God will also bless you, become the channel that the blessing flows to them. And that means you get the blessings first and then it goes over to, uh, to meet their needs. And in this story, I want to concentrate on three aspects. It's not only three aspects that we can talk about, but I want to focus on three things. Number one, the faithfulness of this man. Number two, 
the fulfillment and we'll see what we mean by fulfillment that was the focus of his ministry fulfilling the total the complete will of god in the lives of everybody and number three we will see the fellowship he maintained with other people that even though he was a man of prayer he didn't use that as an excuse not to have fellowship with other people he had fellowship with God, he had fellowship with the Apostle Paul, had fellowship with the Colossians, the church that he probably was a pastor of. Now, let's look at the first part, faithful. And here we are looking at him as a faithful minister. Writing to the Corinthians, Paul highlighted an essential ministerial quality. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul said this, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithfulness is the quality God is looking for. If you are willing and available and faithful, God can use you to accomplish great things. The objective of many ministers today fall far short of the standard demands by Christ and exemplified in a perforous life. Many are so motivated by echo, fame, power, money, success, unhealthy competition, and many other things to the extent that they deny the very faith uh, they profess to uphold. Paul commended in Epaphras the quality of faithfulness. You see here in Colossians chapter 1 verse 7 as well as in chapter 4 verse 12 how Paul wrote about it. He says, as ye also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, a perfect who is one of you, a servant of Christ saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Now this is what Paul could write about Epaphras. If a letter were to be written today by any Christian, any minister, can they refer to you as a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, from those two verses I have read, there are a number of words or phrases that stand out, and I'm going to pick up on seven of those phrases and share with us some of the things we can learn about faithfulness. The first one is our dear, it mentions there, our dear fellow servant. Why was he dear? Because as a good shepherd, he gave his life for the sheep. John 10 verse 11 tells us that. He gave his life for the sheep in the service of others and of Christ. We are not saying that Epaphras died for the believer. Yes, Jesus died for the, for, for, for the whole world. But Epaphras was willing to dedicate his time and service for other people. He was dear to Paul, a minister, as well as to the Colossians, the members to whom he ministered. Thus, his dearness was balanced and not lopsided uh, one, uh, towards one sector that he feels favorably disposed to. The other word we found there or phrase is fellow servant. Epaphras adopted the disposition of a servant rather than that of a boss. He wasn't trying to lord over the people. He not only recognizes or others' colleagues, but also accepted and discharged his responsibilities to complement the services of other ministers with the ultimate purpose of achieving divine objectives. The other phrase that is mentioned is faithful minister of Christ. He was faithful to Christ. His agenda in ministry was centered on Christ's objects, objectives rather than personal goals as brought out in the phrase, a servant of Christ. He served Christ, not serve. He served Christ, not money. The reason he was in ministry was not to get money, to get rich, to get that or to get this. He wanted to serve Christ and be of benefit to other people. He, another phrase mentioned in those two verses we read, he says, one of you. That is very important. That means that he identified with the people he ministered to. 
the phrase saluted you shows that he was not only expecting salutation uh, from the members as some would do, but he also considered himself as being part of the people. Now, the next phrase is always abounding. Now, he didn't say always walking, but he says always abounding. That means he did more than was necessary. He abounded in that work. If it was prayer, he abounded in it. If it was service, he abounded in it. He did it in such a way that people could notice it. This, this describes his constancy in service. He is constant in season and out of season. As Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 tells us, God rewards such faithfulness. The Bible tells us uh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord <coughs> uh, had made ruler over his household to give the meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. We find that in Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 47. The next phrase that we find is always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Laboring. Prayer is labor. Prayer is work. And which is why sometimes people find it difficult to do it. But again, I have to remind you here that it is not the length of time that you spend in the prayer that really matters as the effectiveness of it. I mentioned to you about listening to a man preaching and the man was worried about his prayer life. He went to the father and who has been a pastor for many years, pastor eight churches, asked the father about it and the father told and answered him. And then he asked the father, how will I know when my prayer is effective? The father says, you will see the answers. And then he emphasized that it is not the length of time you spent in the prayer that really matters, but the effectiveness in touching heaven. I mean, partly because I work Monday to Fridays, and when I come back from work in the evening, I have many other things to do. I have to prepare the sermons, prepare the Bible study outline, and do some other things for myself. My time is limited, and because of that, I don't have as much time to spend in doing all the things that I need to do. The one thing I've been praying to God about is God, give me the wisdom so that I will be smarter and more effective in the things that I do. That is why sometimes, yes, there are times I spend a long time praying, but most of my prayers are short ones. Like the one of the testimony I talked about when the phone rang 3.31 uh, a.m. and uh, I just, uh, I was awake, I heard the phone, so I was able to answer. How long did the prayer last? Just 2 minutes, 33 seconds. Not a long one, but look at it. The Lord took that prayer, answered it, sent an angel to the person that we prayed for in America, and the person, the angel went and, and told the person in the dream, uh, your prayer has been answered, and the person woke up and saw the answer right there. So it is not how long, it's not how many hours, and we're not saying that long prayers is wrong. Jesus fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus prayed throughout the night before he appointed uh, the 12 the, the disciples. After the feeding of the five thousand Jesus went on to the mountain and prayed until very early in the morning we don't know when he dismissed the people let's just assume he dismissed the people around 6 p.m. in the evening and he went up there he was praying till about 3 a.m. that was long prayer we're not saying that long prayer is bad it's not bad but there are times you may not have the time to really pray long prayers so you need to maintain a kind of relationship that even if your prayer is just one minute it's just two minutes, heaven will hear. God will answer. It will be effective. And when you have the time, yes, you can spend as much time as you like in seeking the face of God and praying. So this man was laboring faithfully in prayers. Prayer is hard work, is labor. Now, this is the climax of sincerity in service that goes beyond eye service. It, it also describes the intensity of that service. He was not just a lover or, 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 or drifter, passing time, but an active combatant, serving the interests of the members of the church. The seventh phrase that uh, we come across here 
that identified his faithfulness is that that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Stand perfect and complete. You see, Epaphras was not just keen that the members of the church are born again. Born again is wonderful because it gives you the guarantee that you will make heaven when Christ comes. Or if you die, you will get to heaven. But that's not all that God put us here in the world. If that was the only thing, the day we were born again, God would have just taken kill us, taken us to heaven. But he left you here behind on earth because there are other things you need to do. It's like climbing up a story building. If you are using the step, you go from step one to step two to step three. If you stop at step, uh, step, step three, you won't get to the place where you are supposed to get to. The same thing too with the Christian life. After you're born again, you need to keep on asking myself, what other areas of life do I need to develop to become perfect, to become complete in all of the will of God? So this is what the focus of the Pephras was. This describes his ultimate objective in service and illustrates compliance with the will of God. It also illustrates a godly conduct in effectively addressing problems in the local church. Lack of faithfulness could have resulted in unkind criticism. It's very easy to criticize. Oh, so and so doesn't do, do this, didn't do that, he did, did and that, that is wrong and so on and so on. I mean, people criticize and talk and talk and talk, but those people don't pray for the people. They don't pray. Prayer can do a lot more than criticism, than talking, like, than backbiting. Epaphra decided any issue he saw in the church, he would take it to God in prayer. Of course, as a pastor, he would need to talk to those people, correct those people, but he saw the place of prayer. As a, an, a, an unfaithful minister would rather whack the tongue, twist the mouth, win the uh, eyes, and tear down everybody that does not fall in line with their Pharisee pattern that spend quality time to pray that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Their attitude, disposition, and language um, displays, I mean, the bad language I'm talking about, like backbiting and all those negative criticism, such attitude display lack of respect for faithful ministers. Their criticism not only, um, only produce conflict, confusion, and commotion rather than inspire godliness. The church today, with all its imperfection, need a paraphrasis. Who will pray down revival and renewal of souls? May God make us all the paraphrasis of today. Who will stand in the gap to secure the much needed divine transformation that will make our churches living stones for Christ's kingdom? And only very few in Paul's ministry earned that excellent title, Faithful Minister. It is only faithfulness that will result in a fulfilled and Christ-centered ministry that qualifies for reward uh, following the final fire test. The Bible says our work shall be tested by fire. And if our work stand the test of fire, we will be rewarded. What will make our work to stand the test of fire? It is the prayer that goes into the work to support it, to make it effective. May the Lord find you a faithful minister in these last days in Jesus' name. I said the second thing we will look at is fulfilled. And here we will look at, I uh, will consider the phrase a fulfilled mission in ministry. Fulfilled mission. In other words, there is a goal to be achieved. And the person is on for it. He wants to get to the end of it, not just start and not finish it. Epaphras had a fulfilled mission in his prayer ministry that glorified God as can be illustrated by the following characteristics. I want to now draw some characteristics from the life of Epaphras. I'll mention seven characteristics as well. Compassion, continuity, commitment, uh, composition, <clears throat> completeness, consecration, and another compassion in service. Uh, sorry, the first one was companionship. Uh, the last one is compassion. Uh, so, let's quickly look at this. I'll be very brief in each of them because I want us to get a good picture of who this person was. 
And these are the same kind of qualities that God is looking for in our life, in our ministry, in what we do day to day at home and work anywhere and everywhere. Companionship in service. What does that mean? That is, yes, <clears throat> here we are told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, Paul writes, he says, Yeah, I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaph Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. Paul described him as a companion. We need companions, we need friends, we need people that can help us, that can cheer us up, that can direct us, that can pray for us. Not also this remarkable feature of prayerfulness. He was a prisoner in Rome. Many of God's saints have done their best work in prison. Epaphras wrote nothing of his own. It is not said that he had any visions in, in that prison, but his work was prayer. He labored fervently in that prayer. And notice it is in the plural. He says prayers and always, which means it was something that was continuous. It wasn't like Paul that had a writing ministry in the prison. He was writing the books that now became the Bible, uh, the different uh, books in the Bible, writing letters to these churches. But he had another talent, that of prayer, and he turned it to good account. Now, what do you learn from that? It tells you that our gift may not be the same. But whatever gift God gives you, turn it to good use. Be faithful in it. He didn't write anything, but we learn of him today because he had prayer ministry and he did it faithfully, wonderfully, to the point that heaven recognized it and we can learn about it today. And I tell you, that man, the time he was in prison, he couldn't have said that the prison was boring because the whole presence of heaven would have been there with him in that prison as he prayed and saw the face of God. God and daily. And today people complain, oh, I'm bored with life. Hey, try this, I'm bored, I'm bored. You don't know how to pray. Go and pray. When you really learn how to pray and bring down the presence of God, even your room, your house, wherever you are, it will become a lively place because the presence of God and the power of God will prevail and will drive away all burden. The Holy Ghost that the Bible describes as a comforter will come down in such mighty way and drive away anything that could have brought discomfort to you in Jesus' name. Now, number two, continuity in service. We are told in Ephesians 4, sorry, Colossians 4, 12, always laboring. That talks about continuity, always. Always, God wants you to be constant. Keep on doing what you need to do for God all the time. He did this always, every day. He was to be found praying for his beloved people. There are potentially so many interruptions and excuses for not persevering. Many believers are readier to at work than at prayers. Satan has a special ill will at praying people. Someone said that Satan's orders are fat not with small or great, but only with the praying people. If we are to persevere in prayer, it must be prayer in the spirit. Why? Because if it is not in the spirit, you will easily get tired and get bored. What does the Bible says? It says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you are praying in the flesh, you will easily become tired and weak and, and, and give up. But when the spirit takes over, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit will now succor you and help you to pray even through your weaknesses. So prayer will change everything for, for that. So this man had plenty of work to do, even in the prison. He was praying, be like him, laboring for God in prayer, letting your brief prayers take more time, and in this way, bring down showers upon you and other people around you, showers of blessing that will bless them in Jesus' name. Now, the third thing we noticed about this man was commitment in service. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, we are told laboring faithfully all the time. All faithfully. Faithfully describe the character of that uh, labor. It wasn't a person just dragging on, well, I must do this. I have no other option. No, it was somebody that was excitedly doing it with excitement and will see laboring faithfully. These words are like those used 
about Christians in Gethsemane. Uh, uh, he says, being in agony. Sorry, about Jesus Christ in Gethsemane. That being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. He agonized in prayers. Uh, he is with Gethsemane type prayers. He made his prison cell a uh, fragrant with the sweet incense of prayer. What an example worthy of emulation. Real prayer, earnest prayer is hard work. If you are not always laboring fervently in prayers, you will be a dwarf Christian. Would you not, <coughs> um, for your own sake, be perfect and complete in all the will of God? Seek to labor fervently in this work of prayer. There are many today who will give up time for prayer to devote it to other aspects of work, but there are extremely very few who would want to give up some part of their work because they were going to take time, uh, the time for prayer. If anyone did uh, do this, that part of the work he left would soon be filled up and will be done to scratch success in Jesus' name because God will give the grace and God will perfect that which concerns that person. The fourth thing is composition. I'm talking about the character, the character and content of the prayer. Composition of the prayer. The, uh, <clears throat> we are told here the composition of the prayer is described as a well, Epaphras is described as a faithful minister who faithfully used the gift at his disposal, lip laboring fervently for you in prayers. We would have thought that the main theme of a Epaphras prayer request would be for revival or for conversion of souls. No, it was for the believers he prayed for. And he wanted those believers to experience the fullness of God's uh, character. Always praying for them day and night. This was an indirect way of reaching the unsaved. For if believers get more of God's grace, they will go forth to others uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, and find them and save them for the Lord Jesus Christ. The coldness and inconsistencies of believers are an immense hindrance to the conversion of souls. On the other hand, if believers are full of the Spirit, full of love for souls, the world will see that they have something that earth cannot give. And when they show by their joy the Christ that they are satisfied, the world will want to know more. They will come near and ask, tell us the secret. What makes you this happy? What gives you this peace? There are far more people made to think uh, by seeing the joy of believers and their satisfaction in Christ than by any word they speak. In other words, shoot the life. Pray for the life to change. He focused on praying for the life of the believers so that the lives of those believers will become kept to the point it ought to be. And those believers will now become the evangelists, the ministers, the servants that will go out and bring other people to Christ. Epaphras therefore pray for the collusion that they might be perfect and complete, perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's what I want to be. That's what we all should be. That we will all be perfect and complete in all, not some, not many uh, of the will of God, but all the will of God. Number five, completeness in service. In other words, concentrated focus in the service. We find here, he prayed that they may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That is, all that God wanted them to do, uh, that the seal of the Spirit might be very distinct and legible in them. He knew the fullness of Christ's heart as well as the abundance of the treasure laid up uh, in him. So he was not afraid to ask more because he had great faith in prayer. He knew there was great danger of his people standing still and not growing in grace. When believers stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, it attracts divine presence, eradicates uh, problems, and stimulates church growth. There was once a great uh, uh, a time in the New Testament where there was murmuring and a problem in, in, in Acts chapter 6. Why? Because some people were neglected. What did the apostles do? The apostles said, it's not good for us to live. 
uh, the prayer and the study of the word and go and serve table. Let's appoint seven people full of the Holy Spirit to go and serve but solve this problem, meet the needs of these people. We will give ourselves to prayer and to the word of God. And when that happens, what do we notice? The Bible tells us uh, that the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. You find that in Acts chapter 6 verse 1 to 7. That was one result of doing the will of God. Besides this result, uh, this also result to the uh, to the uh, to the salvation of the unsaved. We need to follow the same pattern and when we do like that, we find the believers will live vigorous life for God in Jesus' name. Now number six, another character is consecration in service. We are told in that uh, in Philippians chapter 2 verse 25 to 30. It says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my world, for he long after you all, and was full of prayers, sorry, full of heaviness, because that he heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh on today, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on, uh, but on me also, lest I should have uh, a, a sorrow, which means that he prayed, maybe fasted, to the point that his health was almost damaged because he wanted to help these other people. But God had mercy. He was healed. He was restored because he prayed for other people. And the same will happen to you. As you pray for other people, God will heal you and God will bless those other people. But what do we notice here is that he didn't even consider his life that important. It was the life of the other people he was praying for that he was so concerned to the point that he could neglect his own body. But God knew that he needed to continue living so as to be able to help. He said, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your life of service towards me. Number seven character we notice in this man was compassion in service. Compassion is love, strong love. And so he wasn't doing this because he was forced to do it, but because of the compassion he had. He, we are told here in Philippians 2, 26 and 27, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he heard that he has been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh on today, but God had mercy on him. It was compassion for soul that bear the prayer ministry in his life and kept him on the trust uh, of messenger role, praying and serving. And the Lord help us to do the same in Jesus' name. The third aspect I said I will talk about is fellowship. Fellowship is very important. God created us so that we can fellowship with one another. He didn't want us to be isolated, um, uh, isolated from one another or solitary animals. He wants us to fellowship and fellowship is very, very important for effectiveness and uh, fruitfulness. Often we find that people who have a prayer ministry use that as an excuse to be isolated from other believers under the auspices of praying. This was not the case with Epaphras. He maintained a lively fellowship with Christ through prayers as well as with ministers like Paul and members of the church. Hence, his being described as our dear. It was, it was being, <clears throat> uh, uh, being a servant of Christ. He was one who was very much with Christ. He went to him to get commission and then returned to him to tell him how he had executed them all in prayer. Now, being fellow, a fellow, uh, uh, in fellowship with Paul, a fellow minister, means that Paul could find him readily available to send on errand. You remember where we read 
Paul said, I'm sending him to you, the Galatians, because you heard that he was sick and you've been sorrowful. I want you to see him, that he has been healed, so that you will be restored. Paul wanted him to carry the news. Another time we find that Paul dictated the letter to him to write. He didn't say, oh Paul, you know I'm a man of prayer, you are the one to write. You write, I am praying. If I don't fulfill my hours in prayer, uh, maybe something will fall on my head. And... No, it wasn't like that. Fellowship is very, very important. Prayer doesn't stop us from doing other things that we need to do that will help us to maintain the fellowship with one another. So Paul could send him uh, to uh, see these brethren. He could ask him to, to, to write this letter and he would write it. His recognition of the significance of fellowship and the complementary role of prayer meant that he did not frown at new assignments nor complain of being the deprive of his precious time for praying or developing his prayer warrior ministry. He did not rate prayer ministry more important than the secretarial, uh, secretarial role of writing under the dictation of Paul or running errand. He focused on the end result. His focus was the end result. What are we trying to achieve? At the end of it, whether praying or writing letters, we want everybody to be perfect. Then in the letters, Paul writes to know what to do to be perfect. I need to pray for him for, for God to give them understanding when they read that letter and know how to be perfect. So he focused on that end result. If I go and see these people, it will boost their confidence. So he obeyed Paul, go to them. And it wasn't like in today's world that you can easily travel fast by plane, motor cars and so on. Most journeys in those days were on foot and he would have to travel that long distance get there to do all this and he focus on the end result and recognize every activity as essential part of a giant uh, of a giant jigsaw person required to form a full picture that of the believers standing perfect and complete in all the will of god his cordial relationship with paul made him to record in his uh, epistle to Philemon in chapter 1, verse 23, then salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. So that made Paul to include him in that greeting. Now, finally, his faithful uh, his fellowship with the members of the church uh, that he passed on. Now, being in fellowship with members, he allowed the Philippians to send him on physical errand, such as taking presents to Paul. The Philippians wanted somebody to take uh, some gift to Paul. Paul was away from Philippa at that time to somewhere else. Who did they send? They sent Epaphras. Epaphras didn't say, well, you know, my own work is prayer. Find somebody else to carry the, the, what we want to give Paul, whether money or food and so on. Let me spend my time in prayer. No! It is part of the same business. It's part of the same work. So, and uh, here we are told in that uh, passage, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an order of sweet men, a sacrifice acceptable and well pleasing. So, Paul was writing to the Philippians, he said, I have seen what you sent to me through Epaphroditus. Always in the short form, he said, Paphras, thank you, I uh, accept it, and so on. So, doing one thing shouldn't prevent us from doing the other thing. We need to be balanced, we need to look at the full picture, and we need to maintain the fellowship with one another. He did not despise such physical assignment as being inferior, nor treat them as distractions from the fulfillment of uh, or development of his prayer warrior ministry. The spirit of harmony, I want you to listen to this, make note of it, that the spirit of harmony and fellowship is of greater value in the sight of God than ministerial capabilities that are discharged with an attitude of contention and unhealthy competition. Do I say it again? It's very, very important. You need to listen. You need to register it in mind that the spirit of harmony and fellowship is of greater value in the sight of God than 
ministerial capabilities discharged with an attitude of contention and unhealthy competition. So speak to yourself. Let God speak to you about that. My prayer is that the Lord will depend upon us to be the epiphrasis of today in Jesus' name. We're going to pray right now. I'm going to give you opportunity to talk to God and say, God, make me the epiphrasis of today. I want to be a faithful minister. I want to have all these qualities and characteristics and be excellent in everything. I want to use the, this powerful weapon that you've given me, the powerful weapon of changing life, controlling situations and circumstances through prayer, Brethren, God has given you great power. Make use of it. It is only when you exercise it that you will know that it is there, it is powerful. You don't depend on your feeling and say, no, I don't think I can do this. Maybe I need pastor to pray for this or so and so to pray for it. The power of God is in you. God is inside of you. As you pray, you will see the result. You will see the power. You will see the effect in Jesus' name. Let's talk to God right now in prayers.